I think most of us here are familiar with Paul, the Apostle's letters to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a congregation that had been blessed with many talented ministers and teachers, some of whom had received the power to exercise miraculous gifts. In that church, there were those who could speak in tongues and prophecy and do healings and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, they were using these very powers to elevate themselves and compete for position and power in the church. And so in his letter to them, Paul the Apostle compares the results of different groups' efforts to use their wisdom and their power to solve man's problems, and he compares these to the results that God has achieved through His wisdom and His power in Christ in solving man's problems. So Paul is trying to humble these people there at Corinth who are puffed up in pride. These people who were using their gifts of wisdom and power, Paul is trying to encourage them to use these great gifts in order to pursue peace and unity rather than personal glory and position. They had these great spiritual gifts, but they were still human beings, failed and flawed human beings. Paul's hope was that once they saw how puny their results were in comparison to God's results, they would refocus their energy and their pride into what God had done and not in what they personally had accomplished. This is an important lesson for us today, even though it happened some 2,000 years ago. It's an important lesson for us today because there are still those people in the church who either think that they can do something to impress God, or do something to save themselves, or they think that they'll never do enough to feel right with God. There's some people sitting in this audience that I know personally who never quite seem to feel okay with God. Brothers and sisters, that should not be. When I ask people, Are you do you think you're going to go to heaven? Some brother, some sister have been serving the Lord for 30 years and they say, I hope so. Like I hope the thunder win next year. Or I think so. This passage is a reminder of what God has done and how He has accomplished it. It was an encouragement to them and I pray it'll be an encouragement to you. The wisdom and the power of man. That's where he starts in this passage. Chapter one, actually beginning in verse 18. He begins by reviewing in very general terms the cumulative results of man's wisdom and man's power. So read with me chapter one, verse 18. He says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So Paul contrasts the sum of man's wisdom to the revealed wisdom of God as seen in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In all of his wisdom, Paul says, man has failed in the true test of wisdom. And the true test of wisdom is recognizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the apex of wisdom. This failure, he says, shuts the mouths of the ones who claim knowledge, shuts the mouths of the scholars, 
and the skilled orators. He's saying, if you're so smart, how come you haven't recognized that Jesus is Christ? As a matter of fact, God's wisdom is so great in comparison to man's that He even declared in advance through prophecy that this is where man's wisdom would fail. He didn't wait till after man didn't recognize Christ. He told way ahead of time, watch this now, watch it coming. I'm telling you right now, those of you who think you're so smart, you're going to miss it. And they did. And Paul reminds them of this right here. Now he briefly mentions a group that does recognize God's wisdom over man's, but he sets these aside for now to focus on those who rely on man's wisdom exclusively. So we keep reading verse 22 now. He says, for indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So here Paul goes into specifics concerning man's failure in using his own wisdom. He starts with the Jews. He says, you know, the Jews, they ask for signs. Now it's not that Jesus did not give the Jews signs in the form of miracles and fulfilled prophecy and teachings and of course the ultimate sign, uh, uh, the resurrection. But the Jews, they wanted signs according to their liking according to their criteria. They wanted astrological phenomenon. They wanted miracles on personal request. They wanted political and economic liberation from Rome. They, yeah, we want miracles, all right, but we'll call the shots on the kind of miracles we want you to do to prove to us who you are. And so they dismissed the signs that the scriptures pointed to in favor of signs that suited their own aspirations and their own terms. You know, intertestamental Judaism, meaning the time between Malachi and John the Baptist, you know, that, that time between the Testaments there, that Judaism was divided as to the nature and the purpose of the Messiah with various groups you know, configuring Him to suit their own personal agendas. There were lots of Messiahs, there were lots of writers writing about what the Messiah was going to be like during those times. But Paul tells them, you, the Jews, you ignored the signs promised by the prophets and given in Christ in favor of your own vision as to who the Christ should be. And when He was not according to your own vision, you rejected Him. So much for your wisdom. And then on the other hand, he talks about the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the Greeks, you know, in those days, uh, as far as the Jews were concerned, the world was divided into two camps. There were the Jews and there were everybody else. And everybody else were referred to as Gentiles or Greeks. And Paul says the Gentiles, the Greeks, well they searched for wisdom. They weren't looking for signs, they were looking for wisdom. Now the world at that time was ruled by Rome, but the intellectual influence was still that of Greece. The search for meaning, the quest for knowledge of higher order was not based on revelation, like for the Jews, but rather on reason and thought and uh, deduction. The great philosophers had explained man's existence and purpose in various formulas, and the common man was left to apply these formulas in his everyday life. However, however, death was still the barrier that philosophy could not cross. And so how to live one's life was the center of all discussion. The philosophers did not have any plan, did not have any idea, did not have any way to cross over the barrier of death. They only addressed life, the short life that man had. And when all was said and done, there were really only two conclusions, lots of different philosophical ideas, but really only two basic conclusions that they led to. One, live to the fullest, for tomorrow you may die. Or two, deny yourself to the fullest and cheat death before it comes. 
That was the best that they could do. Such was the wisdom of man that in all of his inquiry he could not breach the limits of his own mortality. And so both the Jews and the Gentiles rejected Christ because they could not assimilate Him into their own narrow worldview. Of course, not all Jews, not all Gentiles did so. Some accepted Him because they recognized that He was not sent according to human wisdom, not sent according to human power, but rather He was the embodiment of God's wisdom and God's power, and God's wisdom and God's power is not like man's wisdom or power. Now Paul doesn't go into detail here about what this wisdom and power accomplished and how it was superior to man's wisdom and power. He merely separates those who accepted Christ as God's wisdom and power from those who rejected this notion and he qualifies the nature of God's wisdom and power in comparison to man's and he says it is superior from beginning to end. Man's wisdom and power may be great but God's wisdom and power is so superior it's not even a contest. And so we move on to verse 26. Now in the following passage Paul goes from the general to the specific. From the experience of the many who rejected Christ to the reality of those who believed and who were actually living out the reality of Christ in their lives. So from the general historic view all the way down to a very narrow personal view of the experience of the believer in God's wisdom and power. So now let's read verse 26 to 29. He says, <clears throat> For consider your calling, brethren, notice he's talking to believers now, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that He might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. Now, the problem at Corinth was not the fact that these people had rejected Jesus. They hadn't, they were believers. But some of them were mimicking the worldly attitude that was espoused by those who considered them wise or considered themselves wise and powerful in the world. In other words, they were Christians but they were acting like people who were out in the world. Some were using their gifts to elevate themselves over others. Some were creating division by gathering disciples around themselves, as was the custom of both Jewish rabbis and Greek philosophers. And so people in the church who had the gift of speaking or the gift of wisdom would try to gather people around themselves to get a following. Now this is not the Christian way. So Paul reminds all of them, the gifted and the others, about their original condition before they became Christians. What does he say? Yes, the wisdom and the power of God in Christ has been entrusted to them for their personal salvation. And yes, they're handling the words of life and the power of the Spirit. And yes, their knowledge of God and revealed wisdom and experienced power was clearly superior to the wisest Jew, the wisest Greek. Yes, you guys are better than all these guys, but, but, he says, he asks them to look back at their own beginnings their own personal histories, and note that they are not the source of this revelation. They are not the source of the power that they have. In other words, you didn't get this wisdom by yourself and you didn't generate this power in yourself. They did not study or debate their way into the knowledge that they had of Christ. They did not develop any physical, psychological, or mystic way the power that they saw and the power that they experienced within the church. You didn't get this on your own, he said. You have it, but you didn't develop it on your own. On the contrary, even by the standards of the world, they were of no consequence intellectually or dynamically. Paul says that by worldly standards, they were actually foolish and weak and of no consequence in the eyes of those who mattered, those who judged these things among men. As a matter of fact, he says, they were the perfect witness to demonstrate to the world God's wisdom, God's power, 
because these were more clearly seen in ones who didn't have any wisdom and didn't have any power. It was so evident in them. And all of this done, why? So that non-believers would be silenced and that believers would give glory only to God and not themselves. Now he doesn't come out and say it, but the admonition is clear to those who are causing division and polarization in the church. You who boast of leadership, he says, you people who brag about your power, you people who talk about your wisdom, you have nothing that was not given to you by God. And if it was given to you by God, the result should be humility, not boasting. Now we know that boasting is of pride and pride is a false sense of personal worth. If you had nothing and all you have now comes from God, then there really is no cause for pride or boasting. The only thing you can really do when you receive these gifts from God is to give thanks in humble gratitude. So Paul is going to go on later on to outline how the gifts given to the Corinthians ought to be used in the building up of the church. But he's going to finish this section by actually describing the nature of the wisdom and the power that God has expressed in Christ. And so he talks about the wisdom and power of God in the last couple of verses of this section. Now so far Paul has spoken of the emptiness of the wisdom and power of unbelievers, the misuse of the wisdom and power given to the Christians at Corinth. Now in one succinct verse he summarizes the visible expression of his wisdom, the visible expression of power in Christ and how it ultimately affects those who believe. So if you're looking, you know, the money shot, the climax, it's right here in verse 30 and 31. If you drifted away while I was talking, time to come on back here for the, for the end part. Verse 30 and 31 he says, but by His doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So what does Paul do? In these few verses he describes God's wisdom and power in terms of what it accomplishes rather than what it is made of or what it motivates. For example, we can describe the power of a tornado by measuring its wind velocity in the tunnel or its speed or direction. You know, we, we, the guys on the news do that all the time. There's a tornado and it's coming down this street and it's moving at 12, 13, 15 miles an hour and the wind speed in the tunnel is 200. You know, they can do it that way. Or we can show you a picture of a Walmart store and parking lot completely leveled by this tornado to the point where even the asphalt was completely sucked out of the ground. Which image demonstrates the power? The graph that says 200 miles an hour heading east at 16 miles an hour, funnel is this big, that picture? Or a picture of what the tornado did to the Walmart? I think the picture of what the tornado did to the Walmart is visceral. You go, wow, that must have been powerful tornado. That one photograph gives you a visceral understanding of how powerful that tornado was. Well, this is Paul's approach to describing God's power and wisdom. A quick picture of what these accomplish in a foolish, weak person considered base by worldly standards. So Paul says that through God's wisdom and power, this very same person receives the following. Number one, this person receives a relationship with God in Christ. You see, worldly wisdom could not even produce a clear image of God, nor could it perceive His will or His mind. But God's wisdom and power devised a way for an ordinary person to not only know the true God, and know His will and know His purpose, but also to have an intimate relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter eight, Paul further explains that this relationship is none less than actual sonship. And I quote 
Romans 8.15 says, For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How's that for wisdom? How's that for power? Man could not even think of such a thing, let alone accomplish it. Man's primal yearning is satisfied by God. What is man's primal yearning? To own a house or a boat? You think that's man's primal yearning? To have enough money to go to Rome or to do this or that? You think that is man's primal yearning? Man's primal yearning is the melding of his spirit and soul into a conscious, and it is a consciousness because we cry out, Abba, Father, a conscious relationship with His Creator. That's man's primal yearning. I want to know and be with God forever. That's what I want. So God's wisdom is seen in the fact that He reveals to us the thing that we desire the most, a conscious spiritual existence in a realm where neither sin nor death exists. That's what we really want. And God reveals that to us. And God's power is seen in the way that He accomplishes this for all men. He does it through the process called imputation. Imputation. God says that God's wisdom is not only expressed in granting man what he innately needs, which is a relationship with Him, but it is also seen in the way that God uses His power to accomplish this thing by imputing to man everything he needs to achieve this desired state. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. God gives us the knowledge of what we need. He reveals what we need and He equips us to have what we need. Now the word impute means to credit someone with something, whether they deserve it or not. For example, one in authority by imputation empowers somebody else with some position. A good example is you know, in the springtime you see people coming to colleges and universities and they receive an honorary doctorate. You know, perhaps they're the speaker at the commencement exercise, perhaps an entertainer, an actor, somebody like that, an activist, and he does his speech or she does her speech and the president of the college will will give them an honorary PhD, an honorary doctrine. Did they have to take the courses? No. Did they have to do the exams? No. Did they have to write a thesis and defend it? Absolutely not. Do they get a doctorate? Yes. How? Through imputation. They imputed it to them. They bestowed it on them freely. It was given to them. Well, that's the system that God uses to give us His power and His wisdom. The apostle mentions four things that God imputes to man through Jesus Christ in order to enable mankind to have a relationship with Himself. Let me give you these four and then the lesson is yours. Number one, God imputes wisdom. Man could not have perceived or discovered God's plan and God's goal without direct revelation. He could have never figured it out. The gospel brought to the Corinthians was not a product of man, but a direct revelation of God. The message they received and now the message they declare is God's own wisdom imputed to them by Christ and the apostles. They are now wise with the wisdom of God. How? It was given to them. It was imputed upon them. Secondly, He imputes righteousness. A relationship with a righteous God requires that one person be like God. In other words, be righteous, just. Man cannot achieve this by any act of the will or system of law or practice of religion. This is where man's wisdom falls short. So what does God do? He imputes the righteousness of Christ, which is equal to His own, to man based on his faith in Jesus Christ. What does Paul say again, Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith. By wisdom, by actions, by works, by law, no, by faith. And so man now possesses the righteousness required to have a relationship with God 
because he actually has the righteousness of Christ. You who feel inadequate, you who feel, maybe I'll go to heaven, I think I'm going to heaven, I think I'm okay. You're thinking that because you're looking at your own righteousness, you're looking at your own accomplishments, you're looking at your own how well am I doing, you're looking at your own perfection meter. Stop doing that. Paul says that God has imputed to you the PhD of righteousness. You've got it. You are no more saved today than you were on the day that you came out of the waters of baptism. You can't improve on the righteousness that He's given you. He didn't give you your righteousness, He gave you Christ's righteousness. How's that for wisdom? How's that for a system? Thirdly, thirdly, He includes sanctification. In the Old Testament, those who came from the correct tribe and then only those who were socially and physically acceptable, in other words, never had been divorced, no marrying outside of the tribe, no physical handicaps, only those people could be set aside, sanctified for service at the tabernacle and later at the temple. Because of Christ, God imputes to us a holiness equal to Christ who himself is able to go into the very holy of holies of heaven to atone for sin and plead for sinners. Hebrews 9, verse 23 and 24. This is a quality and purity of our own sanctification, for it is that of Christ. And I keep repeating the same thing. What is it that God has imputed to us? Christ's holiness, the quality of His holiness is given to us. And then finally, God imputes redemption. You know, we have nothing to offer God, even if we are clothed in the royal robes of the heavenly priests. We have no gift, no sacrifice, no payment for our sins, no suitable thank offering. But God imputes the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf, not only for our sins, listen to this, every time we confess His name, every time we remember Him in communion, we are offering the perfect sacrifice to God. The perfect sacrifice to God. Those who had nothing to offer have been given the perfect sacrifice to offer in order to please God forever. And all of these things, as I mentioned, imputed to us. Wisdom imputed, righteousness imputed, sanctification imputed, redemption imputed. All of them were prepared in His wisdom before the earth was formed and accomplished through His power expressed in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If this be so, Paul says between the lines, if this is so, if, if, if we've been given these things in this way, then there absolutely has to be boasting and rejoicing and glorying for this plan and the execution and result of it is awe-inspired. You know, people, you know, they go buy a banana split at Brahms and they go, wow, that's awesome. They don't know awesome, you know what I'm saying? Banana split at Brahms is not awesome. That God imputes to us the things that enable us to have a relationship with Him forever, that's awesome. Let's reserve that awesome word for things that God does, because I don't want to put people down, but I don't think there's anything we do that's awesome. We do things that are good or kind or great or you know, super, but awesome, mm, I, think we're in the, I think we're in the stratosphere where God exists when we talk about awesome things done and accomplished. And so Paul said, let all who boast boast in the Lord Jesus Christ because it's His wisdom and His power that we receive and that we will glorify forever. Now, of course, Paul will go on in this letter to deal with other issues and problems, and for our purposes, we're going to stop here today. This thought, however, continues to call out to all Christians throughout the ages. From Corinth, Greece, 2,000 years ago, to Choctaw, Oklahoma today, the lessons of this passage remain the same. Lesson one, we still have the same tension 
The world continues to offer up its version of the truth, its explanation of life and death, and 2,000 years of history has not changed the tension that the church feels in this world. We are still marginalized, we're still trivialized, we're still scoffed at by the so-called wise ones of this world. You don't believe it? You should see if you ever mention anything about the resurrection of Jesus or the creation of the world. See if you can get on the radio and talk about that for free. Even though human wisdom has divided any number of philosophies that are soon dismissed by newer ones, and, and, and the gospel remains exactly the same century in and century out, we are still considered as fools and naive and irrelevant. Let's not judge our effectiveness and value by what the world thinks of us. The wise ones in this world didn't get it then, and they still don't get it now. Don't be discouraged. They'll only get it when their knees are bending at Jesus' return, and then it'll be too late. We'll see who is wise then. Lesson number two, we still have the same solution. God calling all people to be His sons and daughters in Christ by imputing Christ's wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and sacrifice freely to them based on their faith in Jesus Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. This is still God's answer to man's greatest problem and sin. So let the world come up with new philosophies and new solutions. We have the good news of the risen Christ and all those who believe in Him are already experiencing the power of regeneration in their lives. I mean, those born again in baptism, they have the new life. The power is in the gospel, brethren. Let's not exchange it for the puny ideas of men. Amen. And then finally, lesson three, we still have the same boast. Still have the same boast. Yes, the world is exploring outer space. Yes, I can talk to somebody in Russia through a little machine with no wires that fits into my pocket. Yes, there are new medicines that will help me and you perhaps live to 100 years, maybe. But this morning in the quiet of my room, I have spoken directly to the being who created the universe and he has spoken to me through his word. And I have peace in my heart because regardless of the condition and length of my life in this place, I have the promise of a resurrected Savior that I too will rise and be with God forever to know and to praise Him because I am in Christ. This is the boast of the ages. This is the boast that reaches heaven. And so my brothers and so my sisters, boast in the wisdom and power of God in Christ, brethren, this boast will never make you ashamed. And as I finish this morning, I ask you, can you make this boast? Can you make this boast? If you can, then cling to it and hold to it and stop saying I think and maybe and I hope. You have it, it's yours. It's always been yours. And if you cannot make this boast, then I encourage you to come forward and receive from Christ the wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that will enable you to have an eternal life with God in heaven. And we do that by confessing Jesus, repenting of our sins, and being baptized.